think I heard a sigh when I got up here. You were probably looking forward to hearing Taylor this morning at 9 o'clock, but unfortunately he's been fighting sickness, we both have, for, for a while, and he's kind of had a relapse, and he just was not uh, able to, uh, to be here this morning to be able to preach, and uh, I'm disappointed too. I know that you are. Uh, so you're going to have to get a double dose of me today, and I, I apologize for that. Uh, along that lines, I appreciate the prayer for all those who are sick. We have lots of sick folks back at home, and as I mentioned, it's, it's been in our family. Uh, I'm definitely not up to par today, so uh, as much as I'd like to give all of you a hug, I'm, I'm just going to give you a fist bump. And if you don't even want to do that, I understand. Uh, but I, I am glad, very, very glad to see you and thankful that uh, we're able to be together this morning. But there are so many that, that are needing our prayers. We want to continue to pray for them. But I am uh, thankful to be able to uh, be involved in Bible study with you and in the preaching of the gospel. I, I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9 this morning. We're going to look at a text that uh, I know that for a number of years it gave me some, some difficulty in being able to uh, feel like I navigated through it just right. And, and it's probably one that's brought up some questions in your mind as well. In Luke chapter 9, I want you to notice where... The Bible tells us in verse 49, toward the end of the chapter there, Luke 9 and verse 49, it says, Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. We are very aware of the fact that the Bible teaches us in other scriptures. Like in Romans chapter 16 and 2 John and verses 9 through 11, that there are those that we are to forbid to teach, that we are not to have fellowship with them. Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9, that if anyone preaches any other gospel than uh, what we have preached, let him be accursed. And yet here is a man who doesn't follow with the disciples, and they're asking, uh, they're telling him, we forbade him. And Jesus says, do not forbid him. This is a text that some would go to to tell us that we really shouldn't forbid anyone. That, that uh, when Jesus uh, makes the statement here in verse 50, he who is not against us is on our side. So really anyone that is upholding uh, uh, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, as long as we can agree on that and they're teaching that, then we should not forbid them. How do we understand this particular passage? Does this teach a unity and diversity? Does this teach that we need to uh, go along to get along? And, and what exactly is Jesus intending for us to understand here? Well, I want you to notice, first of all, as we look at this particular text, we need to understand the context overall. When we look at the text in its context, I want you to go all the way back here to verse 1, chapter 9, and you're going to see in verses 1 through 6 that Jesus sends out the twelve to go out and to uh, a preach uh, to uh, the household of Abraham, to the Jews. And then we have in verses 18 through 20, Peter's, uh, or, or first Jesus uh, predicts his death and his resurrection. Uh, Peter confesses uh, uh, faith in Jesus in Luke chapter uh, 9 and verses 18 through 20. But Jesus predicts his death and his resurrection in verses 21 through 26. And then I want you to notice in verses 27 through 36, Jesus' transfiguration is there. And in verse 37 through 42, there is a demon-possessed boy that is healed. And as you look at this text here, Jesus, uh, they, they come and tell him, that his disciples were unable to cast this demon out of the boy. And, and Jesus says in verse 41, it has to do with the lack of faith on their part. And then as we get to verse 46 through 48, we have the disciples arguing over who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. What I want you to notice as we go through this text is that there are some very natural uh, problems, some challenges that Jesus is facing as he is training his disciples. He has sent out the twelve, but there are still some things that need to be worked through. One of the things that I want you to notice, as uh, we mentioned before, is in verses 37 through 42, there is a certain lack of faith on the disciples' part. 
And this has to, we have to understand this in the context of what's going on in verse 49 and verse 50. There is an area where they're lacking. And, and, and so much so that we'll find them in verse 37 and following, where they are, or verse 46 and following, where they're arguing over who's going to be greatest. There's a tremendous level of carnality and of immaturity, seeking uh, a personal exaltation. I believe that this helps us to understand what was wrong with what they were doing and what Jesus was rebuking in them. When Jesus said, do not forbid him, that word forbid is a word means, uh, that means to restrain, to hinder, or to prevent him from doing his work. Jesus said, that is not what I want you to do in this particular case. Once again, we need to ask, what kind of case is this? What is going on here? Here's a person who doesn't follow with them, and yet Jesus is saying not to forbid that particular person. Well, we've got some questions in regard to fellowship here. And the first one is, can we forbid false teachers from preaching what, what they're teaching that is false? Can, can we have no fellowship with them? And I think that the scriptures that teach that are very clear. How do we understand this one? In other words, who are we not to forbid? What is Jesus speaking about in this case? So let's start out with some considerations that I think are f fundamental, uh, preliminary to the text, if we're going to understand this. <clears throat> because as we look at this account, we sometimes jump to some conclusions when John says, this man does not follow with us. And we hear something that may not actually be there in the text. So let's notice what the text does tell us. First of all, I want you to see that a miracle was performed, and that according to Jesus. Look in verse 39, in, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, in verse 49. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he doesn't follow with us. John acknowledged that this man was casting out demons. And look in verse 50. Jesus said, do not forbid him for, uh, um, uh, for he who is, not, uh, with, uh, is, is on our side. Uh, he who is not against us is on our side. I want you to look at Mark's account because Mark gives us a little bit more information about this. Hold your place there in Luke 9 in our text. But turn over to Mark chapter 9. And I want you to notice what Mark says about this. In Mark chapter 9 and in verse 39, listen to what Jesus says here. Mark 9 and verse 39. Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterward speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. Mark gives us a little bit more dialogue there, which is a little bit different because normally Mark is the one that cuts things short and gets to the point of it and Luke gives us more detail but in this case Luke gives us just kind of a synopsis of what happened Mark gives us some more detail Jesus said in verse 39 that no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me and this is his reason for not forbidding him so a necessary conclusion is that Jesus is necessarily implying that this man worked a miracle. Miracles confirm the speaker. Don't forget that. Jesus said that this man worked a miracle. John admitted that he was casting out demons. And what do we know about miracles? What we know about miracles is that they confirm the miracle worker. In John 3, when Jesus uh, encountered Nicodemus, Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said to him in John 3 and in verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's all we know about miracles. People today don't work miracles. They're, they're charlatans. They're frauds. People who claim to be working miracles today, they're frauds. But when a supernatural event takes place, when a miracle occurs, there is no denying it. There's absolutely no one that can say that did not happen. I mean, even Jesus' enemies could not deny that he worked miracles. They tried to attribute it to Satan, but they couldn't deny that he worked a miracle. Jesus says this man worked a miracle. 
Miracles confirm the miracle worker. In Acts chapter 2, this was one of Peter's arguments for Jesus being who he said he was. In Acts 2, when he preached the first gospel sermon there on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, in verse 22, Peter said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst. When a person works a miracle, God is the one working the miracle. He's working the miracle through that person to confirm that person what they're saying and what they're doing. We know this. Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, the word was confirmed by miracles. Mark chapter 16 and in verse 20, the Lord was working with his disciples, his apostles, and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. This man worked a miracle. That ought to tell us an enormous amount of information about who he was. You say, but he, they said he didn't follow with them. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But I want you to notice that what we have confirmed is that he worked a miracle, and not only that, we see that the miracle was actually done in his name, and again, that is according to Jesus. Notice this in verse 39. Jesus didn't just say, no one who works a miracle can afterward speak uh, uh, evil of me. He said, no one who works a miracle in my name. He's referencing what had just occurred. He's saying, don't forbid this man because anyone who does what he did is not against us. Why? Well, God has confirmed that this person is doing what he's doing in their name. We know what that means. That means by their authority. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer. Because no one's going to work a miracle without his authority. We've already pointed that out. God's the one that is actually working the miracle. So no one is going to work a miracle without his authority. So any actual miracle is going to be done in his name. But here's two very important parts to this text. And that is, this man worked a miracle, and he worked a miracle in the name of Jesus. What is Jesus telling us here? Well, again, as we look in Mark, what the, the details that Mark gives us is telling us that Jesus extended fellowship to all who were with him. Notice, he who is not against us is on our side. Notice here in Mark's account that Jesus defined being for him as belonging to him. Look down in verse 41. Right after he said in verse 40, he who is not against us is on our side. Verse 41, for whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This isn't a change in subject here. He's still making an argument. If you're using the New King James, I'm not sure how the ESV or, or, or NASB translates the beginning of these verses. But in verse 39, Jesus says, do not forbid him. And then he says, for, notice that, for no one works a miracle in my name. You see the word for there? It's the Greek word gar, and it is a word that assigns a reason to something. It means because. People often tell us the word for in Acts 2.38 means because. That's a different Greek word in Acts 2.38. But this word, gar, does mean because. So he says, don't forbid him because. He's going to give us an argument. But look at verse 40. For he who is not against us is on our side. He's giving another argument. Because he who is not against us is on our side. And look at verse 41. For whoever gives you a cup of cold water. Same word. Because He's giving another reason. Don't forbid him because whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now, now stay with me. I, I want you to think about the way that he words verse 41. You say, well, he's not talking about the miracle worker here. Yes, he is. He's making an argument in verse 41 of why not to forbid the miracle worker. Well, why does he talk about giving a cup of cold water to his disciples, the ones he's speaking to? 
because he's using them as an example of someone assisting a person who belongs to Christ. He says, you know this. When someone gives you a cup of cold water or assists you because you belong to me, you know what that means. They're not going to re- lose their reward. What's his point? You do the same thing. Don't forbid this man. Assist him. Be in fellowship with this man. Provide what he needs. And, and notice in verse 41, he talks about because you belong to Christ. That is synonymous with verse 40, he who is not against us is on our side. On our side means to belong to Christ. No, he doesn't follow with Jesus' inner circle of disciples. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't belong to Christ. That doesn't mean that he's not on Christ's side. Jesus defined being for him as belonging to Christ. And I want you to go to the next verse now, verse 42. Verse 42, and notice what he says there in um, Mark chapter 9 and in verse 42. He says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. You see that word but? Again, he is making an argument and it's a continuation. You say, but I've got a paragraph break here. Your translators put that in there. And I think they got it wrong. You don't start a new paragraph with but. That this, this word, the Greek word here, is a, is a word that continues an argument like the word for or gar. So he's making a contrast in verse, verse 42 to verse 41. In verse 41, whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of you who belong to me, he will not lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck. It is a contrast. Give a cup of cold water or cause one of these little ones to stumble. You might be thinking, I thought he was talking about little children, verse 42. (laughs) We're all his little ones. This isn't just babes in Christ. We're all his little ones. We're all his children. We're not to cause any Christian to stumble. And what he's saying is, John, what you're talking about doing is going to be discouraging. It could cause this person to stumble. You need to be assisting him. He worked a miracle. He worked a miracle in my name. He's not against us. He belongs to me. And did you notice in verse 42, instead of saying, whoever causes one of these little ones who belong to me to stumble? He used the phrase belong to me in verse 41. What did he call it? Verse 42. Who believe in me. The context tells us several things about this miracle worker. He worked a miracle and by the authority of Jesus. God worked a miracle through this man. He was doing what he did by the authority of Jesus. He belonged to Jesus. He believed in Jesus. This is not the person out here who is in rebellion to Jesus. We're going to notice that in just a moment. But I want you to see, as far as preliminary uh, observations go, we're talking about a situation where Jesus is saying, do not forbid fellowship to someone who's in fellowship with me. Now, who was this person then? That's another question that we need to ask. Who was this man? Well, the text doesn't tell us. John just said in verse 49 that we, uh, 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 we saw someone that we saw, uh, a, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We don't know who he was. You say, well, well, Brett, you've affirmed that he's worked a miracle. He's done it in the name of Jesus. He belongs to Jesus. So, so could that have been? Well, Jesus had other disciples that were not of the twelve. I want, I want to remind you that Jesus sent out uh, quite, quite a number of disciples. Look in Luke 6 and in verse 13. In Luke 6 and in verse 13 it says, And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. 
He didn't just have 12 disciples. He called all of his disciples to him. He chose 12 out of them. So when John said he doesn't follow with us, he's talking about that inner circle with that 12. He could have been of the other disciples. And not only that, but notice also in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10 and in verse 1, it says, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. What were those 70 going to be doing? What would they have the ability to do? Look in verse 9. Jesus commanded them to heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. To do what with the sick? Heal the sick. He appointed 70 other disciples to go out and to work miracles. No, this was not out of place to have somebody working a miracle in his name. And, and we see that this is exactly what was going on at this particular time. Drop down to verse 17 in, in, verse, in chapter 10. Drop down to verse 17. It says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. What was that fellow doing? He was casting out demons. What did the seventy say that they were able to do? The demons were subject to them. It wasn't just the twelve who had the power to do that. But what was afflicting the twelve at this particular time? They had the idea that they were the greatest of Jesus' disciples. Did they not? They were even arguing about among them who was going to be the greatest. And that wasn't the point. Jesus had a specific work for the apostles to do. That's one of the reasons there was a selection of, of uh, uh, deacons in Acts chapter 6 because the apostles could do something that the rest of, of the members of the church couldn't do there in that first century church. Yes, they had a very special work to do. That didn't mean that they were greater than all of his other disciples. But they thought that. That's what they were arguing about in chapter 9. So it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus had others who could do this, but his disciples wanted to forbid them because they felt like that was something that was only reserved for them. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, one of the problems in the early church is that some of them had an idea that there were some spiritual gifts that were more important and more valuable than others, and speaking in tongues was one that they all wanted. And one of the things that, that Paul conveys to them is that that is not the greatest gift. <laughs> you know, that, that's a carnal mind that's looking at that, and that's really self-serving to want to have that gift because they felt like it elevated them. It's possible that maybe John and some of the disciples felt like casting out demons was something that was reserved only for them because it was one of the greater ones. And that shouldn't surprise us with their immaturity and their carnality because what had happened with the young boy. They weren't able to cast out demons. And here they encounter this man who is casting out demons. That could have stirred up a little bit of jealousy in the twelve. And certainly among John and maybe his brother James. I don't know. I'm just saying that with everything that we know about what was going on, it makes perfect sense that they would have a little, bit of, a little bit of ire in them when they were unable to cast out a demon from this young boy and they were rebuked by Jesus for it and then they encountered this man casting out a demon that doesn't follow with them. Somebody might say, but the 70 would have known who they were. Well, do we know that? I don't know that. Do you know that? There's nothing in the text that tells me that the 70 were all the closest of friends. They had all known each other since, you know, high school. Or We don't know that. All we know is that he had 70 other disciples that he sent out. I don't know how well they all knew each other. Bottom line is that there were others who had this power and this ability to do this very thing. I can tell you who he wasn't, though. He was not a fraud. He was not a, a would-be exorcist like the seven sons of Sceva. Remember in Acts 19, 
in verses 13 through 16, the Bible tells us that some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of Jesus, uh, Lord, uh, the name of the Lord Jesus, over those who had evil spirits, saying, "We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches." The first thing you notice about this is they took it upon themselves. They weren't given that authority. They were frauds. And you know the rest of the story. <laughs> that, that demon said, I know Paul, but I don't know you. The demon came out of the man and jumped on them, and it was violent. Oh, this, this man was not a fraud. He was not a charlatan like the seven sons of Sceva. And I want you to notice also that he was not one who was in rebellion to Christ, not one who was insubmissive to Jesus, because Jesus was very clear about that in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7 and in verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. When we put these two accounts together, Jesus says this man cast out a demon or worked a miracle in his name. But then over here he said, but there's going to be a lot of people who claim to do things in my name, but they're not submissive to me. They're working iniquity or without authority. They're, doing, they're taking it upon themselves. He said, I don't have any fellowship with them. We shouldn't either. But this man was not one of those. Jesus said that this man was actually doing what he was doing in his name. So what is the point of the rebuke? Jesus' rebuke is to teach his disciples that a person does not have to be in our immediate circle to have the Lord's approval. It seems that his disciples, and maybe the sons of thunder were leading this, it seems that they were overly zealous about what constituted a disciple of Jesus. It seems that they wanted to put their own requirements and definition on who was truly a follower of Jesus. And that was limited to that inner circle. As I said, John may have led in this effort to stop him. He was a son of thunder, Mark 3 and verse 17. And really, this is not a new thing. It's certainly not new among us today. There are definitely brethren who become overzealous in trying to make that group smaller that belongs to Jesus than what it actually is. And, and I, I want you to understand, normally what I'm having to warn about are those people that are wanting to make the circle of fellowship broader than what Christ has made it. That, that has been a prevalent problem among us and always will be. That people are trying to extend fellowship to people who are not in fellowship with God. We need to be aware of that. But let me tell you, an equal but opposite danger is to narrow that circle of fellowship with the Lord and with us more narrow than the Lord makes it. We cannot allow ourselves to become overzealous in this regard. Look at an, uh, another event in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 11. Turn over there. I, I know you're going to remember this event, but I want to look at this quickly. In Numbers chapter 11, the Bible tells us that two men remained in the camp. Numbers 11, I'm sorry, in verse 26 is where we're going to pick up. Numbers 11 and in verse 26. <clears throat> But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Isn't Moses' rebuke interesting? He, he got to the heart of what the problem was. He said, are you zealous for me? Apparently Joshua was. Joshua didn't want anyone else doing what Moses had done. 
And Moses is saying, this is a good thing. I, I wish everyone had the Spirit of God upon them. You know what Moses was saying here? Moses was saying, Joshua, it's not about me. If God wants to put His Spirit on someone, someone else, if God has put His Spirit on them. But Joshua was afflicted with something that I think that all of us have to be very careful about. And that is this personal human loyalty. We need to be loyal to one another in Christ. No doubt about that. But that doesn't mean that our loyalty to one another supersedes our loyalty to Christ. Ever. It's all about Jesus. It's not about who is the person that ought to be exalted up here, who is the person that ought to be the most important, who we think ought to be the most important. Oh, this is a very dangerous thing. We've got to understand that it is not about us and that we can't make that circle too small. You know, the Bible reveals to us that God has always had faithful servants in other circles and in other places doing His will. Notice with me in Galatians 2 and in verse 9. When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me Barnabas, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They were preaching in different areas. They weren't following with one another. They didn't travel in the same band. They didn't stay in the same group. Peter and others went and preached to the Jews and Paul and Barnabas went and preached to the Gentiles. You know, in 1 Kings 19 and verse 18, God had to make Elijah aware of something that he didn't know. And that is that God said he had 7,000 other faithful servants. We just don't always know. And they don't have to be a member of the same local church that I'm a member of. They don't have to live in the same geographic area I live in. They don't have to run in the same circles. People sometimes ask me, Brett, what do you know about this preacher? I, sometimes I say, I don't know anything about them. I don't know them at all. And the fact that I don't know them doesn't mean that they're not faithful. The fact that they don't have the same friends that I have doesn't mean that they're not faithful. God forbid. We've got to make sure that we understand that God always has and always will be doing this very thing. Paul and Barnabas went separate ways themselves in Acts chapter 15 over the disagreement about John Mark. And yet, they were still in fellowship with one another. They just didn't travel together anymore. We need to understand that this is a very important point to help us to understand some things about our fellowship. We must extend our fellowship to anyone who is in fellowship with God within or without our geographic circle. Faithfulness to the Lord is not determined by geographic location, but by adherence to God's Word. Their fellowship with God is determined by their adherence to His Word, and my fellowship with them is dependent on the same thing, and my adherence to His Word. So let us understand that. Let's see what this event does not teach. This event does not teach that there are many ways to heaven. And this passage has been used or attempted to be used by those who would say that there are many ways to heaven. Like the spokes on a wagon wheel, we're all coming from different directions, going different directions, but we're all going to end up in the same place. That is the testimony of denominationalism, and it's false. There are not many ways to heaven. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus made clear, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that goes back to the fact that this man belonged to Christ. He believed in Christ. He did what he did by the authority of Christ. The contrast to this is what we read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You've got to understand, there is one way to heaven, and that is through submission to Christ. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of the Father in heaven. This does not teach that we can be in fellowship with those who teach and practice error. Jesus is not in fellowship with those who teach and practice error. 
2 John chapter 1 and verse 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. When someone's not teaching the truth, they are not in fellowship with Christ. And we could replicate that again and again. 1 John 1 and 5, God said that if someone walks in darkness, they're not in fellowship with me, they're liars. And then as we saw the contrast in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and for that reason, we can't be in fellowship with him either. Again, Second John, right after he says that in verse 9, in verses 10 through 11, he says, and you don't receive them. Don't even greet them. This passage is not teaching that anyone who is religious and claims to be a Christian belongs to Christ. As we read in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, many will say, Lord, Lord, but they do not practice what they do by his name or with his authority. Jesus has many who claim to be Christians, but Paul said in Philippians 3 and verses 17 through 19, they're actually enemies of the cross of Christ. This event in Luke 9 and Mark 9 does not change that truth. And this does not teach that we're not to oppose and forbid those who teach error. Romans chapter 16 and verses 17 through 18, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Note that. He says, note them and avoid them. That word avoid is the same concept of withdrawing from that person. And on and on. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, the elders of the church are to stop their mouths, those who teach error. In 1 Timothy in chapter 1 and in verse 3, Paul told Timothy that he would charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This event is not opposed to that in any way. So this man was a man who was in fellowship with Christ, but simply did not travel with his inner circle. We need to understand that the fact that we may not know anything about a person, they have not been on our registry or our list of who is faithful, we don't determine faithfulness based upon that. We listen to their teaching. We find out about who they are. And that's how we determine our fellowship with that person. If they're doing what they're doing truly in the name of Christ by his authority, then that's where we extend our fellowship. But this is not teaching that we're to have fellowship with anyone and everyone who calls himself a Christian. Well, I appreciate your good attention. Did I finish early or late? I, I don't know. He wanted me to announce that uh, the classes are going to be dismissed, and if you're visiting with us uh, this morning, classes are across the street. Uh, the children will be dismissed in just a moment, and uh, they'll be coming back over here. But we're going to close with a word of prayer at this time.